by a flash of lightning or a rumble of thunder. Those storms set to drift out into the North Sea by dawn. So again, most places becoming dry once more by this time tomorrow. Temperatures generally 9 to 13 Celsius. Into tomorrow, some wet weather, certainly across uh, the Northern Isles, possible at first, but for most it's a dry, fine day. Still a few showers again over the Highlands and the Western Isles, but generally bright conditions after those overnight thunderstorms clear through. So again, feeling pretty pleasant in the sunny spells. May turn a little hazy, the sunshine at times, but we'll still see those temperatures getting into the high teens or the low 20s. Do watch out, though, for those thunderstorms arriving overnight. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now today we look ahead to some of those huge issues of the day. Prime Minister's Questions is coming up, of course, we've got a look ahead. And we'll find out what the government's big announcement on unilateral Brexit action means in an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister's envoy. We'll also, of course, tackle those inflation numbers. But first, your morning headlines. Very good morning. It's half past nine. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Inflation has risen to its highest rate in 40 years, rising to 9% in the 12 months to April. It was 7% in March, and according to the Office for National Statistics, the further rise has been largely driven by increasing costs of fuel and energy. The energy price cap was hiked by 54% for the average household at the start of the month. A Conservative MP has been released on bail pending further investigation after being arrested on suspicion of rape and sexual assault offences. The man, who can't be named for legal reasons, is in his 50s. He's also accused of abusing a position of trust and misconduct in public office. The Foreign Secretary says it would be very positive if the UK and the EU could negotiate a solution to the Northern Ireland Protocol, but there must not be a delay. Liz Truss has set out plans to rewrite Britain's post-Brexit trading agreement, changing the rules on how goods enter Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Almost half of the nurses and midwives hired in the last year have come from abroad. That's prompted concern from leading nurses over how sustainable it will be to maintain recruitment of the workforce. Figures from the Nursing and Midwifery Council show the majority of new appointees have come from India and the Philippines. 
TV Online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Now let's head back to Tom for this morning's briefing. A very good morning to you. It's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now to the latest from Westminster this morning. MPs will cram into the Commons this lunchtime for PMQs, Prime Minister's Questions, that is, where the Pestminster scandal, Northern Ireland protocol and cost of living crisis will no doubt be high on the agenda. Of course, yesterday a Tory MP was arrested after allegations of rape and released this morning pending a police investigation. He's been told to stay away from the Commons. In short, we've got a lot to get through. And who better to talk through today in Parliament with Tim Montgomery, political commentator and former advisor to Boris Johnson. Welcome to the programme, Tim. Uh, what is your big guess for what is going to dominate Prime Minister's questions this lunchtime? Well, I think if Keir Starmer has any sense, uh, Tom, it will definitely be the inflation numbers this morning hitting 9%. I think there have been plenty of Prime Minister's question times when, understandably, the Labour leader has gone with issues that we've discussed many times together, uh, like Partygate. But I think out there, the real issue that is worrying most people is their ability to put food on the table, pay their energy bills. And Labour, you know, supposedly the party of the working people, have probably neglected that issue. They have some good policies, including um, attacks on uh, energy companies, a windfall tax on energy companies, which polling in the Daily Telegraph overnight shows is actually incredibly popular with voters. And so I think if Keir Starmer is uh, trying to reconnect with those uh, fabled voters in the Red Wall in particular, he'll be talking about inflation today. It's interesting looking at that uh, call for a windfall tax, of course, a very populist policy and one that the Tory party has uh, until this point been making pretty um, economic arguments about rather than emotional arguments about. And to many people in the country, I suppose this is an emotional issue. Now, I suppose we can argue the rights or wrongs of it. The Tories, of course, saying it will deter investment. It will be bad for our transition to net zero. It will create a, an uneven playing field. But on the other hand, potentially, it's a, it's a political win, even if it's an economic hit. Yeah, I'm not even sure myself, um, Tom. I would regard myself as a Thatcherite. And Mrs Thatcher, when she first came to power, um, she introduced windfall taxes um, because sometimes markets don't work properly. Um, conservatives believe in markets, but when markets don't work properly, we make interventions, whether it's the housing market or other markets, to ensure that those markets are sort of prodded in the right direction. And I don't actually think energy companies are making sufficient investments in the future at the moment. I'm, a, I'm not a Labour supporter, but I think Labour have been ahead of the game on this one. I think they're correct. And when the uh, exchequer is needing money for things like helping to protect, particularly the poorest from this um, rising inflation, we've got inflation today at 9%. But I think most people agree that those at the bottom of the pile are probably facing an inflation rate of 11 or 12 percent. Their prices, the baskets of goods that uh, poorer people tend to uh, be uh, most likely to purchase, they are rising faster than the average. And so um, I take your point about the dangers of taxing generally sectors that are critical for the future of the economy. But on this occasion, a one-off tax on a sector which has done very well over the last couple of years and isn't really making the kind of investments that we would like, I think is perfectly justifiable. Now, of course, this week started with uh, various announcements from the government on crime and justice, making streets safer, offering the use of tasers uh, to, to police officers, indeed 20,000 more police officers making progress towards that target too. Has the government's intention to make this week all about crime and law and order, has that all gone to pot? <laughs> gone to pot? You're talking about Sadiq Khan again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, it I might as well um, be. <laughs> look, I think it probably is partly a week that people are talking about crime, but not in the way that the government um, expected. Uh, we um, obviously had this overnight story of a Tory MP 
being in police custody for um, you know, allegations of uh, historical rape. Um, we obviously don't want to touch the specifics of that story, but you know, I'm old enough to remember the 1990s when the last sort of long-standing Tory government really began to hit very serious trouble that ended in that huge 1997 landslide victory for Labour. And it, this sort of era has the same sort of ring of sleaze uh, dogging the Tories. You can make sort of individual excuses for individual um, MPs, etc. But the, the picture is of a, of a parliamentary Conservative Party that isn't behaving anywhere near as well as it should. I think the huge difference for the Conservative Party is that Keir Starmer is not Tony Blair. He doesn't have the charisma um, of the man that destroyed the Tories uh, in three successive general election victories. But no, um, the Tories, like during the 1990s, Michael Howard had incredibly strong policies in the 92 to 97 period when he was Home Secretary to tackle crime. We saw crime plummet during that period, uh, partly because of a rising prison population. It did the Tories no good, though, because the Tories were seen as economically out of touch and sleazy. And that's why I think um, this inflation, dealing with this inflation problem, showing that the Conservative Party has an answer to people who are worried every single day about paying the bills. Unless the Conservative Party gets that right, anything else is sort of window dressing, really, and, and irrelevant. I suppose just finally in this conversation, talking about Keir Starmer's leadership, as that has come into the frame in the last few weeks, uh, to what extent is the prospect of uh, this Partygate investigation, this uh, Beergate investigation, I should say, are we potentially looking at, before the end of this Parliament, someone much more dangerous to the Conservatives, much more charismatic, much more like an heir to Blair coming to the fore? Well, it's certainly a possibility, and it would be a weird turn of events that um, after all this party gate farrago, Boris Johnson stays in office and Keir Starmer actually leaves office. Um, I think, though, um, Labour don't have, for me, an obvious successor. I think there are uh, people in their ranks who are credible for the future. Um, Wes Streeting, who's currently the Shadow Health Secretary, strikes me as a very good prospect as a future Labour leader. But you know, just young people are sort of catapulted up the sort of parliamentary rung, the parliamentary ladder too quickly, in my view uh, now, Tom. Mm. Ideally, you'd see them tested. I think that's what's happened with Rishi Sunak. You know, he was supposed to be the all-conquering hero um, just a few months ago, but various events have shown him to be actually mm. quite flat-footed on a number of issues. And so mm. whilst Wes Streeting or various other people, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, look like they're good candidates at the moment, I think for the country's sake and for Labour's sake, I think they'd want a little bit more time to see whether they're as battle ready as perhaps they just look at the moment. Well, Tim, thanks so much for talking through that wide range of issues. We'll be paying close attention to Prime Minister's questions from midday today, I am sure. Thanks for joining us this morning on The Briefing. Now, yesterday, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss announced the UK's plans to make a unilateral move to alter the post-Brexit protocol. After her announcement, I met with the Prime Minister's special envoy on the protocol, Connor Burns, Conservative MP and Minister of State for Northern Ireland. This is worth listening to in order to understand what happens next and how the whole UK may be affected. Connor Burns, you are a minister in the Northern Ireland office. You're also now the Prime Minister's special representative to the United States on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Has the government admitted that when it signed up to this deal back in 2019, it got it wrong? No, I think the government is being informed by the lived experience of 18 months of protocol actually implemented on the ground. We signed up to it in theory to protect the European single market. We were leaving the European Union. It was part of the mechanism to create the new uh, movement of goods within uh, the island of Ireland, where you have one part of the UK that has left the EU on the island and one country, the Republic of Ireland, that remains uh, in the EU. And I think what we're saying to the EU is that we signed it. It had provisions within it under Article 13 to change bits of it or even to replace it in its entirety. It had Article 16 provision to uh, unilaterally for either side to change or suspend bits of it if they felt it was disrupting trade or having societal impact. 
And I think what we're now saying to the EU is, look, 18 months on, we can see how there are companies in GB who've stopped supplying to uh, Northern Ireland. And we need to find a way where we can recognise that a lot of the goods that come into Northern Ireland stay in Northern Ireland. They never go near uh, the European single market, the Republic of Ireland. And let's just have a way of treating those goods differently. Article 13.8 and Article 16 have been repeatedly cited by your colleagues over the last few weeks, indeed over the last 16 months as these talks have been going on with the European Union. Is it fair to say that potentially when the United Kingdom negotiated the, this deal, uh, the United Kingdom government anticipated a moment like this, anticipated that changes may need to be made? Well, it's correct to say that we didn't know what the actual situation would be on the ground as the new arrangements evolved. And we are now sort of relying on those uh, things in the, in the protocol, which pointed the way potentially to change them. And despite, by the way, what was said today by the Foreign Secretary in the statement, we are very, very clear, she said it herself, we still want a negotiated solution to this. What we are pointing to is the solutions that we have tabled with the EU, a trusted trader scheme, uh, strong criminal penalties for anyone who breached the trusted trader scheme. Um, just to treat the goods differently, from those going into Northern Ireland and staying there, and those going on uh, into the Republic of Ireland, into the single market. We now have 18 months of lived experience to inform uh, our approach to this, and we think that there are very practical solutions that would rely heavily on data sharing in real time with the European Union enforcement authorities that could make this work. It's fair to say the EU have not been the most cooperative over these past 16 months of negotiations. I was speaking uh, to your colleague uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Cabinet Minister for uh, Brexit Opportunities last week. He told me he thinks the EU is trying to punish the UK, and that's why it's being uncooperative in these discussions. Do you share that view? I can see why uh, Jacob uh, feels that. I can see why uh, Jacob said that. I think in my role as a, as a Northern Ireland office minister, I need to focus much more on the detail of how we fix this for everyone in Northern Ireland, how we dial down the politics, get it onto the, the technicalities of the solutions to allow goods to move freely within our own country, save of course for animal stuff that sort have of always been checked between islands regardless of territorial jurisdictions, and crucially unlock the, uh, the challenge of getting devolved government back. Ultimately, peace was arrived at in Northern Ireland through a series of difficult compromises. Some would say some political fudges. Is it the case that really when we're going to solve the Northern Ireland protocol issue, what is required here is a lot more give and potentially a little bit of a fudge? What is required is an understanding of what's at risk. Uh, the devolved institutions are at risk if we can't resolve the protocol. It requires compromise, it requires uh, understanding, um, and it, understa it, sorry, it requires a, a political determination to find the space in which to fix this. And yet within the EU we're not seeing that political determination as things stand. In fact, the response, the immediate response from the European Union to the statement that Liz Truss gave to Parliament was that they would uh, potentially carry out repercussions upon the UK. They didn't use the words trade war, but it, they came very close to it. Are we inching towards a trade war with Europe? The most important thing for us is fixing this and fixing it so that we can get revived, devolved government in Northern Ireland. This is more important to get this right for our United Kingdom and for the communities in Northern Ireland than almost any other foreign policy or economic uh, objective. And that is our determination. We hope that the EU will re-engage with us in a spirit of compromise and create the necessary space to allow us to find a way through that. But we will legislate in the interests of our own country if that's what it comes to. Is that a threat? No, it's just a reality. We cannot stand by as the government of the United Kingdom uh, whilst this is going on in Northern Ireland and there isn't a local government in Northern Ireland delivering for our citizens in the six counties. Could you give me an estimation what is the likelihood of the EU going along with the UK in these negotiations versus needing to use this legislative route? How likely is it that the EU will cooperate here? Well, none of us know the answer to that, but the whole history of our engagement with the EU, the negotiations since we had the vote to leave the European Union back in 2016, are lots of things that we were initially told were impossible actually coming to pass. Uh, and I just hope that the, the declaration by the government of our intention to legislate if we can't reach 
uh, and agree compromise with the EU will, will trigger everybody having a serious look at this again and reaching solutions that work. Work for us, work for the EU, work for the Irish Republic, but crucially, work for communities in Northern Ireland. Now, last week you gained a new <coughs> title that of the Prime Minister's special envoy to the United States on the protocol. Clearly the US takes a big interest in peace in Northern Ireland. They see themselves as a guarantor of the Belfast Agreement. Um, why is it that you achieved that new title last week? I think the Prime Minister just wanted um, some serious engagement in the US. The US are heavily emotionally invested in the uh, process that led to the institutions that sprang from Belfast Good Friday. There's a great affection for Ireland, for the United Kingdom in America. And I think the Prime Minister wanted me to go and to talk to our American friends and allies and help them uh, see the full context of where we are um, and hopefully give them an additional perspective uh, on the challenges and why we may have to take the action we may have to take. Do you think the Americans get it? The UK government says again and again that it wants to take action to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, whereas much commentary, and particularly commentary on the EU side of things, seems to suggest that the protocol is supporting the Good Friday Agreement, whereas the Unionist community in Northern Ireland and the British government say precisely the opposite. Well, the protocol as it's currently being implemented and interpreted is the cause of the Unionist groupings not wanting to go back into power sharing. Power sharing are the direct product of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So it is the protocol that is now imperiling the institutions. Do the Americans understand that? <coughs> I, think the, uh, I think the audience in the United States is incredibly receptive to hearing more about what's actually going on in Northern Ireland, understanding the societal challenges, understanding the trade frictions, understanding that products are disappearing off shelves in Northern Ireland that have been available for, for decades, and understanding in greater detail the, the practical technical solutions that we have tabled to the EU that meet their objectives, meet the objectives of the Irish, meet our objectives and deliver for Northern Ireland and would restore power sharing in Northern Ireland. If this all collapses, if power sharing is not restored, if the EU levels trade repercussions upon the United Kingdom, if this all falls apart, what does that say about the Prime Minister's Brexit negotiation? Has Brexit failed? Brexit has not failed. We've got a technical problem, um, which is informed now by 18 months of data <coughs> in Northern Ireland. We've got to fix this. If it fails, it shows that we are not able to engage pragmatically with our closest neighbour and ally, the European Union. And I would hope that what's been seen in Ukraine and the aftermath of the tragic events there is that Britain is a reliable ally, Britain is a friend, Britain is wedded to shared values and we surely must be able to find the landing ground to sort this out in all our interests. Connor Burns, thank you. Thank you. Well, much more to look forward to on that issue over the coming weeks and months, some tense negotiations. But back to home, inflation has increased to 9% in the last 12 months to April, up from 7% in March. It's the highest level in 40 years and was largely driven by rising cost of fuel and energy. So while this uh, rate is fairly high, it's still lower than rates in Poland and the Netherlands, although it is 0.7% ahead of the US now, 1.7% ahead of, uh, of, of Germany there, and 7.8% ahead of Japan. Well, joining me now to discuss this in detail is Chris Snowden, Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Welcome to the programme, Chris. I, I was speaking to Liam Fox on this issue yesterday, who pointed to the money supply issues, uh, not denying that there are other issues that affect inflation, but pointing to money supply as a suggestion as to why Japan might have quite such a lower level of inflation compared to the EU, the UK and the US. Does he have a point? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a major, major driver of, uh, of inflation around most of the world. The enormous amount of quantitative easing or money printing that's gone on, uh, particularly during the course of the pandemic. I mean, literally trillions of dollars are being uh, created. And it's fairly basic economics to expect that to have uh, quite a significant effect on the cost of living and, and prices. You, you're basically de you're debasing the currency. So that has been a major driver. I think it's only really with these new figures today that we're seeing the effects of the war. I mean, there are a few people who uh, are keen 
to blame all the inflation on the situation in the Ukraine. Um, up until April, I think most of the inflation was COVID related in some respect, whether it was the lockdowns, whether it was the, the money printing to pay for the lockdowns and the furloughs, and in just a general lack of productivity as people weren't working as much. In the new figures, which from April, it's the first month we've got data from where uh, since the um, the NG price cap was, was lifted, and we're seeing really dramatic increases in the price of, uh, of petrol, diesel, gas, and electricity. I mean, electricity nearly doubled year on year. Gas has gone up by more than 50%, and uh, petrol and diesel have gone up by more than a third. We shouldn't, however, um, blame all the inflation on on that, on the price of oil and gas, both of which are very, very high at the moment and show no signs of going down. If you look at the other um, the parts of the ONS report, you can see that, uh, for example, food and soft drinks gone up by 6.7%, restaurant hotels 8%, furniture, household equipment, and maintenance 10.7%. You know, there's a, what you might call an underlying level of inflation that has got nothing to do with the situation in Ukraine or really to do with energy prices. But as we go through the rest of the year, we're going to, I think, see food prices go up and people are really going to feel the pinch with that. And then, of course, we get into winter when people are using more gas and electricity. It's interesting talking about these issues in isolation. Of course, gas and oil prices going up, and I suppose there's very little that could have been done about that at a global level. But talking about the, the supply of money and the policies that the Bank of England and indeed the government pursued over the last two and a half years, why on earth did the Bank of England not see this coming? A uh, very good question. I think... It's because they have um, they kind of go along with a view that is popular with quite a lot of people that you can't really have inflation in the modern world. Basically, a lot of people got very complacent about inflation. We didn't see that much inflation after the financial crisis when there was a huge amount of quantitative easing. I think that uh, gave some people a false sense of security. In actual fact, we did see inflation in asset prices and and in housing. Now we're seeing it um, on the on the the shop shelves uh, because things like furlough you you you're not putting money uh, into the banking system which a lot of the quantitative easing was used for you directly giving it uh, to people and they, they spend it and you know you, you've got a classic case of too much money chasing too few goods yeah the bank of england has been absolutely asleep at the wheel only a year ago it was still predicting two percent inflation or maybe maybe a bit less uh, and they don't seem that bothered about doing anything about it um, we've got, you know, in real terms, interest rates are, I think, probably historic lows. I mean, who, who tries to fight off 9% inflation with 1% interest rates? Well, I suppose in our final uh, minute and a half of, of programme, what on earth can be done about this? There are no easy answers. All the answers are painful. And, and while we talk about what answers may be needed to quell inflation, other people are demanding that the government spends yet more money, which to me seems like it would make the problem worse. It would be like pouring petrol on an already burning fire. Yeah, well, it would be, and particularly if the money is ultimately being printed by the Bank of England. You're absolutely right. There are, there are no solutions to this. You know, the, the crisis is upon us, and there isn't much we can do that won't uh, make things worse in, in some respects. Putting up interest rates being an obvious example, I'm quite sympathetic, actually, to the Bank of England. It doesn't look like they're going to put interest rates to 15%, which is what they were last time we had inflation, anything like this level, because that's going to definitely cause a recession. We're probably going to have a recession anyway. That will cause a severe recession, negative equity. Millions of people won't be able to pay their, their mortgage. So I think the Bank of England is just hoping that the global issues settle down, that hopefully the Ukrainians can, can win the war. We'll see peace over there. Gas and electricity prices come down. Um, but, you know, you're basically crossing your fingers and, and hoping for the best. But it's going to be painful either way, unfortunately, and I'm afraid there yeah. simply isn't a solution. Well, what a cheery way to end the programme there. Chris Snowden, thanks so much for your analysis. And I suppose let's hope that the solution can be found in Ukraine sooner rather than later. Otherwise, this is going to be a very, very painful few years. Well, that's it for me on the, uh, on the briefing this morning. Coming up, it's to the point. But first, here's the weather forecast. Good morning. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. We're on a bit of a repeat cycle at the moment. More hazy sunshine for most places today. Most of us will be dry until later when there's the threat of some thunderstorms. 
Here is the washing machine responsible for the repeat cycle, low pressure, throwing up weather fronts, bringing moisture, but also bringing warm and humid air up from the south. Still a few leftover showers across northern parts of Scotland this morning. It'll take a time to clear away, but for most, after the downpours overnight, it's a fine day to come. Hazy sunshine and feeling pleasant enough in that sunshine as well. It will cloud over once more this afternoon across Northern Ireland and down to the southwest, the threat of some showers moving in. But as I said, for most, most of daylight hours will be dry, fine and quite warm with temperatures in the high teens or low 20s, 18 in Glasgow and Belfast, maybe 24 in London. And then 